<laughs> Welcome to Bond Park. I'm Sarah Geidlinger. And I'm Marshall Ward. And today we have Bob Egan. The legendary Bob Egan of Blue Rodeo and many other bands. But more importantly to our show and what we do here, Bob is the film, music, and interactive media officer within the city of Kitchener. He is a community builder in every sense of the word, and we are so lucky to have him here in Waterloo Region. And Marshall, I'm so excited because Bob has shared his World of Steel music with us. This is a project that he's worked on with musicians Dave Gray on percussion, Amy Lang on cello, Steve O'Connor on keyboards, and Derek Brady on bass. Here he is, Bob Egan. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome Welcome to to Bond Park. Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Do you enjoy Bond Park Podcast? If so, we would really appreciate it if you leave a review, like, rate, subscribe, but most importantly, share directly from the platforms with your family and friends. That's the best way to get the word out to everybody and more people will get to see our show that way. So click those like buttons and share our show. Thank you. Thanks. (laughs) On with the show. This is it. Bond Park is supported by Waterloo Brewing. Since they first opened their doors in 1984, Waterloo Brewing has invited thirsty beer lovers to pour the boar. A symbol of strength and courage, the boar is a fitting symbol for Waterloo Brewing. The company is not only Ontario's first craft brewer, in operation decades before the current microbrew trend, but it is also the largest. To pour the boar is to taste an Ontario brewing tradition that is always evolving. The core recipes on which they built their success remain the same, using only fresh and simple ingredients. Waterloo Brewing's balanced quality beers like their traditional IPA, Dark Amber, and Craft Lager were created to be enjoyed year-round. Perfect for sweltering summers, their crisp and refreshing fruit rattlers have been wildly popular. These drinks blend craft lager with real fruit juice to create sweet and punchy flavors like watermelon, tart cherry, raspberry pineapple, and Waterloo Brewing's award-winning grapefruit. Waterloo Brewing's beer store is located at 400 Binghamton Centre Drive in Kitchener, or visit them online for free local boar-to-door home delivery at waterloobrewing.com. Whether you've been pouring the boar since 1984, or you've never poured the boar before, Waterloo Brewing has your perfect pour in store. Bond Park is supported by Dennis's Horseradish. Bond Park's Marshall Ward first discovered Dennis's at Vincenzo's in Waterloo last year, and since then his whole family has been hooked. Dennis's Horseradish is a family-owned farm-to-fork horseradish producer in southern Ontario. Their horseradish comes from a family recipe that goes back generations, using only the freshest roots. If you want to crank up the heat, you can get their horseradish in hot, extra hot, jalapeno, and more. They also have a sophisticated Dijon-style horseradish mustard, a punchy seafood sauce, and a rustic beet relish. Find Dennis's Horseradish at Vincenzo's, Charles Quality Beets, and Sobeys locations. Check them out online at dennishorseradish.com and on Instagram. We are supported by Ginger Goat Hot Sauce. Made right here in Waterloo Region, Ginger Goat was conceived out of a passion for heat, flavor, and fun for your mouth. The original goat is a flavorful medley of smoked pineapple, ginger, and garlic with a solid headbutt of Carolina Reaper at the tail end. That last ingredient is what gives the original goat its deep, long-lasting heat, but the complex balance of flavor makes it approachable compared to other mouth melters. Ginger goat is made with fresh, all-natural ingredients so you can taste the difference. Ginger goat packs a flavorful, peppery punch and adds a wave of fragrant aromas and zing to your favorite dishes, from wings, soup, and tacos to poutine, burgers, and chili. Find ginger goat hot sauce at Vincenzo's, Innocente Brewing, Coddle's Catch, Coffee and Tea, Crow's Foot Smokehouse, Graffiti Market, Jackass Brewing, Four Quarter Butcher Shop, Block 3 Brewing, and more. Also follow them on social media. We are supported by Hitchhiker Beverage Company. Ready to take your taste buds on a tour outside the ordinary? Hitchhiker Beverage Company crafts lemonade in eight amazing different flavors like Front Porch Peach, Soul Mileage Mango, Back Road Raspberry, and their newest Pink Lemonade. 
Made in small batches with all natural ingredients, Hitchhiker All Roads Original Lemonade has roots in a family recipe dating back to the 1800s. The label on their beverages bears the image of their grandmother, the namesake of the company, Hitchhiking in the 1930s. Hitchhiker also makes amazing real brewed cold teas in three delectable flavors. Ask for Hitchhiker's Beverage Company by name at your favorite local grocery store, restaurant, or specialty shop. Check out their amazing offerings at hitchhikercompany.com.
Bob Egan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. It's been interesting to try and make this happen. I think we canceled once due to COVID, once due to scheduling, and now we've we've all sort of found this one time where we can get together and talk, and we're very appreciative of that. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to be here. The fact that you've kept this high quality podcast going for so long, uh, where others have dropped by the wayside, is a testament to your passion, and I'm I'm truly delighted to be to be a, a small part of this tonight. Thank you so much for saying that. And I do have to add, you have the most beautiful radio podcast voice. I love it. Well, I tried to tell that to Jim Cuddy and Greg Keeler, and it (laughs) didn't go very far. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's just beautiful. So um, like I said, we normally start by saying how we met you, but this is our first time meeting. Um, I just sort of cold DM'd you, very excited about the position that you hold. Um, you had at uh, KPL and now at City Kitchener. So our whole thing is about community, living in, working in, taking from, giving back to, leaning on, holding up. That's our focus on this show. And with the common thread being that everyone's from the region. So We'd like to hear more about your role as film, music, and interactive media officer within the city of Kitchener. Well, it's a um, it's a wonderful, wonderful position. I'm not that my boss is listening, but I, <laughs> I am. I'm just absolutely thrilled to have this opportunity. Right? I'm, I've had a couple of great opportunities since I left uh, uh, Blue Rodeo almost five years ago, and uh, this opportunity with the city is. Uh, it's like it was designed for me. I'm a, um, at this point in my life, I'm a builder. I want to build things. I don't want to manage or be a bureaucrat. I want to build. And so um, when I interviewed for the job, it was uh, quite interesting because I said, uh, I said right off the bat, you know, I, I don't really need the job. I've got a great job at KPL. I love my boss. We've got a great thing going, but this, the possibility here really speaks to me and, you know, my heart is, is in music and what I can do in the community. And so that's why I, uh, I left KPL. Uh, it was a very sad parting, um, but uh, I was welcome with open arms at the city where I get to um, for the most part, set my own priorities. And, um, You know, I work uh, very closely with my boss and upper city administration in economic development. And I've laid out my my goals very simply. I have two goals. One on the music side is to build the infrastructure that will support and develop local musicians. Very simply. And on the film side, it's to, uh, to attract film production to Kitchener. Um, for the purpose of economic development. That, it's that simple. But within each of those are, you know, I'm, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I've got right. so many things I can do to fulfill those mandates. And like we were sort of touching on before we were officially recording here, it, it, like you said, building the infrastructure to allow for that art scene to sort of happen, it's already there. You're just opening those conduits so that it makes it a simpler, smoother, more accessible transition for people to access what's already happening. Well, yes, yes. Many musicians as they age uh, realize that it is their duty uh, if, they've been, uh, if they've been blessed with this career in music, which is truly a blessing. I don't know, however you cut it, that they have a duty to uh, reach back down the ladder and pull up those behind them right? To support and mentor and give back, uh, you know. And uh, so it's, it's nothing noble. It's just kind of the calling that, that most, uh, you'll find most musicians of a certain age are drawn to. My take on that is that so many musicians, and I talk to them on an on a ongoing basis, don't know how to keep their career or their craft moving forward. And it's my role to, to illustrate those pathways and to provide motivation and opportunity for them to keep moving forward. You know, I remember the, uh, the first time uh, I was in Chicago uh, back in the eighties and I played a, a gig at the, uh, at the um, Cabaret Metro legendary uh, bar in, in midtown Chicago. And I thought, this is it. Oh my gosh, I'm on a stage and there's 500 people and there's a couple 
kids leaning on the stage watching me play. You know, I'm like, oh my, it just doesn't get any better. That was such a huge step for, from the bars. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that was just a uh, one step in the process, right? And you think back to uh, to Springsteen, the first time he played. Um, uh, the bar in Asbury Park, the Stone Pony. Did he think that that was, that's it? I can rest now. I've made it. I'm here. Or did he think, great, I've played here. Now I can springboard and get up the coast of Boston. I can play in Philly now, right? And my job is to, is to uh, reveal those, the next steps for local musicians to move their careers forward.
During the uh, Canadian rock renaissance between uh, 1985 and 95, we had a ton of great concert venues here in Kitchener and Waterloo. And it's kind of like they came and they they went. Do you have any insight on how these, both the music waves, but also how the venues kind of come and go in a town? I uh, I tend to lament and feel like we'll never have it as uh, that good again with all these different venues for performers to play in. Well, if I look at this philosophically, there's a golden era for everything. You know, there was a golden era for cars. That's gone, right? There was a golden era for guitars, for vintage guitars. It's come, it's gone. There was a golden era for live music. And I, at my age, I hit that. It was amazing that I, I could play in bars and venues in the late 70s and the 80s five nights a week. I was in a college town on a, on a Tuesday night you could see live music in the late 70s in probably nine different clubs. And on the weekend, it was 20 different clubs. But those things all come and go. And, you know, it's, it's uh, sad, but I don't look to the past. I look to the future. You know, I, I, I would say that the past of music is, uh, our, you know, middle-aged white people sitting in bars listening to cover bands. And to me, the present and the future are multicultural BIPOC teenagers sitting in bedrooms with their laptops, right? Mm -hmm. So rather than, uh, Marshall, you know, look to the past. I mean, I get sad when I, when I realize how things have changed, of course, but it doesn't move the ball forward. I'm, I am more focused on where the industry is and where music is and, and nurturing that. Uh, for the betterment of society and to move people's uh, careers and their craft forwards. You know, the, the live music, I had uh, a number of talks with uh, a Tammy from Rhapsody before she closed down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was common knowledge that the model of selling enough beer to hire a band, to draw enough people, to sell enough beer, to pay the band, to draw the people, to sell enough beer... <laughs> that that model was was dead. It was mm -hmm. dying, and that there has to be a new way forward. Do I think that um, live music is dead? It absolutely is not. Will it look different than it did uh, ten years ago, two years ago, twenty years ago? Absolutely. And my job is to uh, to help uh, develop and discover that new paradigm for what live music will be. And that's that's one of the reasons I get up every morning excited to go to work.
we just talked to Mark Logan, actually, owner of Encore Records last night. Um, in podcast time, this won't make sense, but it was just last night. And we were talking about that era of going to your local record store and picking up what you wanted to listen to or going to a local venue. And and the access is is just so different now. We talked about musicians being paid fairly for their work, right? With these Bandcamp Fridays and all that kind of stuff that's going on. What's the City of Kitchener doing to help boost, you know, uh, putting some dollars in the pockets of local musicians? Well, we are, our big, um, our big focus now, at least in the creative industries division, is to, um, is to compensate artists and musicians for their work. So we look for opportunities. Uh, we can easily justify paying musicians fees for performing. And so we are doing this in a couple different ways. One of them is uh, uh, by partnering with uh, Amit Mehta over at Good Co Productions mm -hmm. and his concert in the box series. Fantastic. Yes. He's, what a wonderful he's, movement that is. Well, I, I know. I talk to other music officers throughout Ontario, and I tell them about uh, some of the lo local players we have, and Amit being one of them. And they are envious. They all want an Amit, right? The guy just hits it out of the park. So we we can easily justify um, covering the expenses for the musicians. Mm -hmm. And as far as how much we compensate them, we believe in um, equity, right? That that is that is not negotiable. We're not looking to pay people with exposure or anything other than fair compensation for their work. And I think um, this is probably the first time in the history of music where the word equity has been used in paying musicians. You know, as, as far back as uh, a year and a half ago, I'm talking with Basil uh, Donovan from Blue Rodeo. And he says, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm gigging 35 years later. I'm still back at the Cameron playing Wednesday nights, you know, and he's playing for the exact same amount of money mm -hmm. they, he was paid 35 years ago. Right. Stings and so, a little. yeah, yeah. So we I think if the pandemic has shown us anything and it's shown us a lot, sure has. it's that. um when the, when the pandemic and the lockdown hit, uh, humanity turned to the arts for connection and for comfort. You know, Netflix, and they turned to music, right? That's what people were creating. That's what people craved. So music was there for humanity. Now, as we come out of this, we're simply asking, and I don't, and I don't think this is a big ask at all, and I think it will be reciprocated, that humanity will be there for music. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be in the form of equity and fair pay. So that's one way we're giving back. Um, we're looking for opportunities to pay uh, musicians for performances. We've got a, um, a, a grant that we just released in uh, early March um, called the Create and Connect Fund. And this is a, a grant we've been able to put together uh, the city in conjunction with Center who firmly believe in supporting the local scene. Um, uh, Rob Sonoda over there and Will Muir, big fans of, of keeping it hyper-local. And uh, this grant will pay, we're doing micro grants of $1,000 each to 14 different musicians for creating content and connecting with their audiences, whether it's live streaming or videos or audio releases. That's a beautiful thing. It makes me think uh, something I, I've never um, envied about uh, emerging aspiring young artists is I've never liked the idea of young singer songwriters having to play in venues like, let's say, a, a coffee shop or a noisy venue where the music is not forefront and center. There's clanking of glasses <laughs> and people eating food. And uh, I've always felt there's a lack of, uh, I guess, dignity that comes with that. And uh, that actually brings me joy to think that I hope that there's other ways for musicians to go than playing in those types of venues and not being heard. Mm -hmm. Well, as a person who did that for many years of his career, <laughs> I share your sentiments. I don't think those days are over. I think that's, you know, just a part of paying the dues, right? And you learn a lot from playing your heart out when nobody's listening, believe me.
Bobby mentioned Basil Donovan, who I've had the pleasure of seeing live, not just with Blue Rodeo so many times over the years, but also performed with Jim Cuddy solo and uh, Greg Keeler solo and Oh Susanna. Anyways, I, I think of uh, yourself as the same. I've seen you live so many times in different variations, and uh, that, that must have felt like an amazing run you had with Blue Rodeo. Oh, it was amazing. I mean, 17 years of seeing the world with these guys. I, it was, uh, I'll tell you, if anyone out there has the uh, opportunity to, um, to join Blue Rodeo or a band at that level, I urge them to take it. It's uh, because it's just a lot, a lot of fun. It's truly an honor. You know, the, uh, the uh, first time I realized that just, I moved up here from Mississippi. Um, I was a Chicago boy and I was living in the deep South, working on my uh, solo career and failing, failing miserably. You know, Marshall, if I had a dozen people that were clinking their glasses and talking over me, that would have been a success. That was a good night. <laughs> that was a good night. I didn't even get to that. But uh, I remember the first uh, cross country tour because Blue Rodeo always uh, tours the same time of year, the same way. They start in January 2nd or January 3rd in Victoria. And we end up two and a half months later in St. John's. And uh, long about Winnipeg, we were playing the, the Walker Theater. It's now uh, named after uh, Burton Cummings, I guess. But old timey theater, just a lovely, lovely downtown venue. And uh, after the show, we're standing in line and there's a meet and greet. And people just kept coming up to me, um, thanking me and welcoming me to this country. And that night really stood out. People are saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a dentist. So if you need any dental work, here's my card. Just let me know. Right. Or people who were saying, you know, we've got a, we've got a cabin over in, um, you know, Lake of the Woods. So if you want to get away for a couple of weeks during the summer, I'll give you the keys, things like this. And I remember uh, getting on the tour bus that night and uh, going to sleep and just thinking, realizing that, uh, that, Blue Rodeo is more than a band, that they're a cultural touchstone. They're part of the fabric of this country. And that the money that they pay me to be in this band was only half of the compensation. And the other half of the compensation was the goodwill of the Canadian people. And I, from that moment on, I, I respected that so much and I cultivated that goodwill. And uh, I always knew in the back of my mind, someday, I want to take that goodwill that I've been blessed with and use it for the greater good, right? Which is what I can do now in this job. That opportunity. Yeah. The yeah. building that you're talking about. Yeah. So my, my calls get taken. Right? <laughs> so then, so then you, all these years with Blue Rodeo and then you decide to come back here or to here. So is that pull was your wife is from the area? Uh, yes, my wife is from the area, but I moved here, uh, 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was looking for a cheap house that I could build a recording studio in. So I found a, uh, a hundred year old, uh, house, uh, in the downtown core that was a, a derelict crack house. And I got it. I'm zoning in. I'm trying to pinpoint your area. I think I'm getting close. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, 17 years ago, if you went to crack houses, you would have probably have known my house. Well, I didn't know, but uh, I am familiar with the area. <laughs> so the, uh, the, uh, I got it. It took out six and a half tons of lath and plaster and totally uh, uh, refinished the thing, stripped all the wood and brought it back to just a great, great house. And then it was many years after that, I met my wife and, uh, and had my son. Oh, yeah. okay. What, what brought me to Kitchener was cheap real estate. Well, that's not the case anymore. So you bought it a good time. <laughs> I did.
So then I just want to get back because we veered off for a little bit, but we spoke a lot about your role with music at the city of Kitchener and we, we kind of skipped over the film. So I want to talk about the film a little bit. Um, I know my um, 13 year old daughter, 12 at the time, she entered in the youth video competition last year and really enjoyed that process, learned a lot. And then shortly after that, I saw you post something. I don't catch everything on Facebook. I'm not a great Facebooker, but um, I saw you post something that was like, hey, how are your kids using TikTok? What are you guys using TikTok for? How do you connect with it? And I was like, well, you're really reaching in. You're really trying to find out what people are using and how they're getting there. So let's talk more about that role and what, how that's built and, and what it is that you're doing there. Well, if we start from the big, the big picture is that uh, film production is a, uh, it's over a 2 billion, that's billion with a B, billion dollar industry in Ontario Mm -hmm. every year. And the majority of that happens in the uh, greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Um, And it's the the demand for content is high and it's going to just keep getting higher and uh we are we are an internationally renowned hub for foreign television foreign movies and domestic production as well so it is a huge industry and my job is to start to bring that bring it home to kitchener and it's just a thrill to do that i i started um People say, oh, you had to build the foundation brick by brick because I'm the first film officer the city has had. And I said, well, I didn't build it brick by brick. I I actually had to mix the mortar and build the bricks. (laughs) And uh, it's been so rewarding. Um, We are now... um, We are now on par. You know, it's it's just blowing up. I I got three calls today uh, for films that want to come here and shoot. And these are, uh, you know, small to medium sized production. The, the total economic impact on the city, on our hospitality industry, should these three come through, would be uh, somewhere between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. That is the power of film, mm-hmm. right? It is, uh, it generates money. So uh, I, I've been at the city almost a year now. And... Um, we're we're getting I'm getting close to having all of the infrastructure built that will attract production. So then my eye is turning to what do I do next? Do I work on the the local industry? Right? Do we look at uh, putting together uh, hubs for creativity, hubs for film technology? You know, uh, you know we have a lot of uh, technology companies here and many that are involved in film. Um, do we look at uh, building a studio or attracting investment to build a studio here? There's many options on the table for how we can uh, take part in this, this uh, incredible economic boom that's happening in Ontario. And what's and so our, I, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was going to say, what's our draw? Is it our, our tech? Like I know um, like Christy was involved in the technology for the Gemini movie with uh, Will Smith, this aging and uh, reverse aging technology is, is the, our tech the draw or is it a mixture of tech and maybe like our landscape and what architecture we do have? What is, what's our pull? Um, well, currently uh, it's all about locations. Mm-hmm. So today I got uh, a request for, we're looking for a block we can close off for a week uh, with that has fencing that can double as Harvard University, and we want to film <laughs> a street riot there. Okay, just another day at the office. Right. So it 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 you get you know I got a call a month ago for we want a clean factory. We want five thousand square feet that we can have to ourselves for two weeks. And we want to recreate the Star Trek star base inside that. Oh, can I go? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And this, we get, you know, these calls every week, if yeah. not daily. And uh, the job is, is calling people, hustling, being creative, and just trying to find locations um, that, uh, that will match. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that full well, 90% of my work will not result in the location that works. But the business works this way. When the scouts see that you're hustling for them, they tell their, their colleagues. And they're like, ah, if you're stuck, call Egan in Kitchener. You know, he'll hustle for you. 
from a product, from a production point of view, it's more worth it that way to have somebody working for you and have some type of groundwork in place to get it moving. Yes. Film happens on a very tight schedule, mm-hmm. right? So um, it's, it's location, location, location. <laughs> so a lot of hustling. And what is a clean factory, like an old factory that's suitable for filming in or a, a new factory? What is a clean factory? We were unable to find that location. <laughs> <laughs> watched a while ago you speak at a TEDx Laurier University talk about uh, the beggar and the icon and you talk about something called the Tula perspective and I was blown away by how impressive your public speaking skills are you you craft the story like just you had me hooked in the first seconds and I stayed with you the whole time how did uh where did that come from was that something <laughs> inherent or is that something you started when you were a kid in school or where did that come from um no I would like to say it came from being an altar boy as a teenager, <laughs> being up on the stage. Uh, well, first off, thank you for the compliment, uh, Marshall. It was a, um, there's a couple, a couple factors there, right? I, I, number one, I'm Irish. And so uh, I've been given the genetic gift of, of gab. Uh, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a storyteller and uh, always have been. And so when giving a speech like that, the, you know, when many people prepare for a big speech, they try to not be themselves. They say, okay, I've got out my game. I've got to, you know, be somebody else and set it high. And I found uh, one of the uh, tricks of public speaking is to, to be yourself. And, 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 you know, in your opening statements, as you start to talk, you, you set the bar, right? And this, this works for public speaking and it works for uh, performing when you're doing solo material, your, your own material, right? That your audience is primed. Your audience wants to be moved. They want something to happen. 
And your job is to move them from point A to point B. They're already at A and they're ready to go. So the easiest way to move people is through emotion. And so I don't know if you went back and look at that speech now, you'll see I put a couple little emotional triggers, right? Right up off the top and that, uh, that other people can relate to. And uh, so they're going, oh, yeah, I, I felt that once. Wow. Okay. So now they're starting to be emotionally engaged and they're, they're identifying with the emotions that I had. And uh, then once you do that, it's as simple as, you know, mapping the story out the arc, right? That you just don't want to go on and on and on. You have to look at it as a graph where you start and then you ramp up and you ramp up and you ramp up and you ramp up till you get to the very top. Pow, there's the payoff. And then you take two or three minutes, you bring people back down and you're done and you leave them wanting more. It's it's the same structure as a, a song, right? I was going to say, it's just like music. You're, you're building that tension and then you break it for the listener. Yeah. And it, it, it may have seemed like I was just speaking off the cuff, but I, I, I recited that speech probably 100 times. I never wrote one word down. I just, because if I wrote it down, my mind would go back to the paper. And I wanted to ingrain it in me as just a story, a natural thing that felt natural. We were, uh, we were out at Greg Keeler's farm uh, recording at the time before that speech. We were out there for, you know, I don't know, a week, 10 days. And when you're recording a record, you have long hours where nothing happens, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we're going to do the piano for a while. That's three hours, okay, or whatever it is. And I would just walk out in the fields and in the woods, and I would just tell the story out loud. And I, I repeated the story a hundred times to myself. And so when I went up there, you were, I wasn't doing it from memory. I wasn't doing it from paper. I was just telling the same story that I knew really, really well.
Thanks. Uh, that explains why it looks so effortless uh, when you finally do get up on that stage and do it. Well, it looks effortless because I put a lot of effort into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It became effortless after all the practice, right? <laughs> yep. So I'm, I'm going to keep pulling us back to these roles that you've had with the city because they fascinate me. So I want to talk a little bit about your time at the KPL. I remember yes. the first time that I saw an article or a headline about what you were up to there. And I thought, geez, is that a new role or do, am I just noticing it because it's you? Like, did that role exist before or did you create this role? This, um, well, I had a couple different um, uh, roles in my portfolio. One mm -hmm. was fundraising and that role did exist prior yeah. to me. And then the other was um, kind of overseeing events. And uh, that role also existed. I mean, there was a staff that was putting on amazing events before I got there and, and continued right through my tenure and they're putting on amazing events now. So they, they, uh, the roles existed, but the direction I was given was um, to, to help change the public's perception of the library. You know, the, the library, the, and this is under the leadership of Mary Chevro. She's the CEO. Um, she felt so strongly that uh, the library is a community asset that goes far beyond the traditional bounds of, of um, book lending, a book of book lending. Yes. Uh, she, she saw it as uh, more of um, it's a community asset and uh, she, what she did, and I think in her mind, what she did is she broadened the definition of literacy from the traditional, uh, you know, book version of literacy to all kinds of literacy. And she said, you know, what literacy best serves the community? And when I was hired, uh, at top of mind was digital literacy. There was uh, recent studies that show that there was an incredible gap between the haves and the have nots in our community. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you what, if you are um, uh, fall into that digital divide, you your life will be compromised uh, economically, socially, some would even say emotionally, right? It, it was a big thing. And her mission is we need to provide this community with the thing that's gonna be the greatest for them. So my goal was to create a digital media studio to raise the money and, and help design and pull these pieces together uh, to where we could really have a big impact on the community. And uh, my job there, while it was, you know, very intense, the beautiful thing was that um, I was just following the direction of the CEO of Mary, right? She said, I know what I want, and I, this is what I want you to help me get. And, uh, you know, it was one of the greatest um, um, boss experiences I've had in my life. I, I, I just absolutely uh, treasured working for her because we saw things the same way. And, you know, the only thing that was between uh, our vision and uh, where we currently were, the only thing in there was hard work. And so much of that hard work boiled down to storytelling, that you had to frame this all in a story that you could convince donors and granting bodies that this was a worthwhile thing. And um, we we're able to successfully do that. And I'm, I'm very proud of um, what the whole, the whole team there at the library was able to accomplish during my time there. Very, very proud of that. I'm kind of curious how the KPL has managed to maintain it. Uh, when I walk in there, it feels the same way as, as I did when I was 10. Like it has this very warm vibe to it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea on how they've maintained that very welcoming, warm vibe? It, uh, it has not changed in that way. I would say the first thing are the, are the employees, right? That's a heart of the organization. Without them, it'd just be a building. Mm -hmm. And maybe after that, uh, Marshall, it would be, um, you know, the original design of the building. I think that was designed in the early 60s. And then uh, they re-improved it, I think maybe a decade ago, there was a big renovation and they kept true to the original feel of the thing. And uh, 
Yeah, it, it is. It, I think it's one of the greatest libraries in, in Canada. It's just, it, it, it hits above its weight uh, in so many ways. Um, I'm very proud of my time there and um, a big fan of it uh, to this day. With all your projects over the years, do they tend to intertwine? Like does Bob's Guitars have some role and connection to the KPL and vice versa? And do all these things kind of somehow um, work together? for you you sound a little bit like me too many jobs you have too many jobs bob (laughs) no no i i i realized at a young age very young age watching my dad come back from the factory or the mine that i don't want a life like that i want to do everything Mm -hmm. and uh i have right some people would call it you know i can't settle down well fantastic great i'll take that as a compliment no, I, I, I am, uh, I'm hungry for experience. I love variety. You know, at this point in my life, I want to, I want to be where I can make the most uh, difference. I'm, uh, you know, I don't want to punch a clock. I've, I've never punched a clock. And here's the other thing. I, I've had dozens, dozens of jobs in my life. Um, and I've loved every one of them. You know, I, I just, I have this um, ethic, I guess, that if somebody's paying you money, you don't have a right to complain. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't like it, you leave. But you cannot take that person's money and complain or not do a good job. Oh, if you're going to take their money, you got to deliver. And I also realized that um, working was not an option that you have to work. And so I did the math, right, in life. Like you, like you work eight hours a day and it, and, and, and it affects the rest of your life, all your, your other waking hours. And so I thought that if you don't enjoy it, wow, that's a huge chunk of your life that is negative. And so I, I just did the math and said, I am going to enjoy every job I have and find a way to do that. And I have, I have, I, I find pleasure in, uh, in the act of working.
let's bring that back to Marshall's original question about um, about Bob's guitars. So what was the birth of that? And are you in there laving and sanding and stringing and luthieing? Are you in there doing all these things and loving it? Or do you have a team now? Um, well, I'm not in there anymore. When I uh, left Blue Rodeo, I uh, uh, sold the business to Ryan Allen, the bass player from Romeo Sex Fighter and a big supporter of the scene and a big mentor in his own right. Uh, Ryan had worked for me for a number of years and, uh, you know, he was taking on more and more of the repairs and I became more of the figurehead. And when I joined the library, I didn't want to think about it. I wanted to focus on the library. It required, you know, my focus. And so the natural thing was I just uh, turned over the shop to Ryan. And uh, pleased to say he's, uh, I couldn't ask for a better legacy than him running my shop. But that whole, the whole thing about guitar repair is that it's, uh, it's something I learned back in grad school, back in the early 80s. It's such a, uh, a Zen thing. I, I enjoy it very much. I have a, I have a bench here in my, um, in my house, and I repair guitars now for, uh, for charity. Um, I have a charity, 100 Guitars for 100 Kids, where we accept uh, used guitars, and I uh, work on them and make them play as well as they can and uh, give, them, give them away. So I enjoy guitar repair because it's, this, it's something that requires patience and attention to detail, which are two traits that uh, are not normally attributed to me. <laughs> so it gives me a chance to slow down and get in tune with the guitars, right? And guitars are like, you know, there are, there's uh, principles of guitar repair, right? It's, it's wood and wire, and they're going to react in a certain way. There's tension. And how do you tweak and work on this thing to, to find the sweet spot where this instrument sings? And I don't care if it's a, if it's a $99 guitar or a $9,000 guitar. To me, when they're on the bench, they're all the same. And, you know, I, I get immense satisfaction from taking that extra time and, you know, for clients uh, or for charity and to go on that extra mile, that extra half hour and just bringing that thing to its sweet spot. And in fact, you know, I was thinking about that. I, I will do that for others, guitars, other people's guitars, my own guitars. They play like crap. <laughs> you don't take them to Ryan? <laughs> uh, often I do. Yes, I do. Because I can't be bothered to work on my own guitars. It's like, ah, oh, this is buzzing. Like okay. Me, who's going to hear it? Yeah. Yeah. I'll just live with it. Right. Or <laughs> it's, it's hurting my fingers. I'll live with it. But if it's a $99 guitar for a 12 year old kid, I will spend the extra hours making that thing play great. I can totally relate to that. The, um, the patience, the attention to detail that you're talking about and the hours of work. I think that's the same thing, like how other people meditate or do yoga or find their sort of Zen somewhere else. It's, it, do you find that peace in, in spending that time? It almost feels um, like guilty time, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not, it's time that I'm not spending working or uh, with my family. So I, I, I yeah, I feel guilty uh, repairing guitars, but it's, yeah. So Irish Catholic then, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I get you. <laughs> Bob, when it comes to your recording career, do you spend much time reflecting? Would you go back and listen to old records and uh, your solo material? I was listening to your song, Coming Down Hard. It's such a beautiful song. Do you, oh. do you, ever, do you ever sit and listen to that, your, your, your uh, music? Um, No, I don't. I'm a... Uh, well, rarely. Um, I'll give you an example. I think uh, a couple of years ago, I, I decommissioned one of my uh, Mac laptops. And going through there, I'm pulling all these files off onto a hard drive. And I came across, um, it might have been that w album, my first solo record. And I said, oh, and I, I just, I clicked it to make sure it was, you know, active. And, I, I, and then I ended up listening to a handful of songs. And, you know, it was, um, it was wild because I, I, I didn't recognize the person 
that wrote those songs. I didn't recognize the person who, who sang them and who performed them. Uh, uh, it, it was a really strange experience. Um, you know, uh, I've recorded a lot in my life. I'm, I, you know, I've, I've been so blessed. I've been in studios all over the world uh, and uh, recorded on, you know, over a hundred records uh, as a session musician. I, I've had my day in the sun, right? Remember we talked about the golden age, the golden age of Bob Egan as the steel player has come and it's gone. Mm -hmm. There's a local steel player named uh, Steve Woods. And I remember uh, he, he came and saw me maybe 15 years ago, uh, 14 years ago and asked for a lesson. I gave him a lesson at, at the end of this lesson, you know, I told him ahead of time, I'll give you one lesson. I'll show you everything I know in an hour and a half. It's going to cost you a lot of money, but there's nothing more I can show you. I showed him everything and he got it. One of the few people that got it. And at the end of this lesson, I said, there will come a time when you are the person that people will call for Americana Steel in this region. And he was so humble and embarrassed and like, yeah, right. You know, you're, you're the God, you're the great guy. Sure enough, two years later, that was exactly what happened. And um, I accepted it with grace and said, okay, I've had my time in the sun, <laughs> let's move on. And, you know, to this day, I get calls to, uh, to play on records and I, I refer them all to Steve. It's that, uh, you know, reaching back down the ladder too portion, right? Where, you know, you've had that, like you said, you had that time and it's, it's somebody else's turn. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, uh, Marshall, back to your point of uh, listening to the work you've done. I, um, for every Blue Rodeo record that I played on, and I played on a, a lot, um, when they were done, I never went back and listened to them. And on every recording session that I did, I never went back and listened to them. I, I just wanted to keep focused on moving forward. And so the weird thing is I would be in a, you know, a store or in a mall or an airport or something. And I, I'd, I'd hear, you know, the music in the background and I'd be like, Hmm, oh, that's pleasant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's me. And that was pretty cool when you hear when, you, when that happens. Right. Um, well, I wouldn't know, but yeah. it sounds like it's amazing. Um, I, heard you, I heard you talk a little while ago about how when you recorded with Blue Rodeo, often you were like the last part to come in, kind of mm -hmm. like put that last layer, layer on of yeah. steel guitar. And uh, when you hear those songs, when you're recording them, do you have some sense and go, oh, there's the first single, you know, or there's the, there's the song that'll be part of the set list or do you, when you when you hear when you're hearing them for the first time, I guess at Greg Keeler's studio, um, do you inherently know which songs will you know even the order and where they'll be on the record? Nope, yeah. not at all. I, I it I it doesn't. It's not part of my um, world, right? It it affects my life in no way, and so. It, this is a, a common theme through all of my life. I, so I don't, I don't pay it any attention. All I do is focus on where's my, where, where can I shine here? Mm -hmm. Right. What do I, what can I bring to this song that, that helps it in some way? And there are songs where I can't bring anything and I, I'm not on them. Right. So I'm really, really focused on the song and not thinking anywhere beyond, beyond that. It's a, I realize it's a different way to work, but it's, um, it's, it was what's worked for me over the years.
Well, that too sounds peaceful where knowing where your control lies and where it doesn't and knowing where your attention and your efforts should be put, right? Like um, if your purpose there is to add that beautiful piece of music and, and let it go and let it become what it is, then there's something very um, kind of elegant about that. You know what I'm saying? Well, it, it, it is very simple. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, very simple. liberating because this is my role in the band, right? My role is not to think about what the single is or what the order is and, and just to stay out of all this and, and be and serve my purpose, mm-hmm. which is to be that utility guy that can come into the situation and, and, you know, make the B section rise or make the last chorus sparkle. Right. And um, it's a unique role. It really is a unique role. And uh, it's one I cherished. I I remember I was at doing a workshop at the Calgary Folk Festival, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I started, I'm there in front of my pedal steel, right? And, uh, you know, a couple hundred people in the audience. And I said, you know, I I play on a lot of records and um, you've all probably heard something I've played on. Um, thanks for your support. And I'm going to give you a little example of what I am best known for. And then I just sat there with my hands poised to play and I didn't play for two minutes. <laughs> Dead silence <laughs> until they erupted in applause. And I said, <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> and this was a lesson that uh, Jim Cuddy taught me. He said, I don't want to hear you noodling around. You know, there's six people in this band. There's a lot going on. So when you play, it better count. Otherwise, don't play. And it was some of the best musical advice I got in my life. It's like, get out of the way. Let the song breathe and do its thing. It doesn't need you, right? And then, you know, three minutes into the song, come in with one or two chimes and take this section and make it go Ah, right. Open up to the heavens and then get out. And that's it. And so that whole less is more thing, knowing your place was such a, uh, a revelation to me musically. And it, it, it applies to a lot of things in life. Right. I think that's so interesting that you're saying, um, well, you've explained it to us that that's the interesting part. So what we sort of see or what I would have just sort of assumed was this, um, I'll use the word elegance again, the sort of magical elegance to that portion of the music you've explained in this utilitarian purposeful way, you know, you're, you're not, you're not sitting there to, to play and play and or noodling around, like you're saying, or leave a lot of fat left on the song you're doing, you're, you are serving a singular purpose within that song. That's beautiful. Well, I had, I had great teachers, right. <laughs> and a great band. I mean, my, my goodness, right. These mm-hmm. are, these are some of the, you know, the best players in Canada, North America, in my opinion. Yeah. So when, great. when you, when you uh, moved here 17 years ago, how long did it take for this area to start to feel like home and a sense of belonging for you? Mm-hmm. Um, a number of years. It was, uh, it was very cold and not welcoming when I first moved here. And, uh, what I, how I rationalized that was that the the people that are here, you know, the tech hadn't really taken off. There weren't a lot of um, people from Toronto moving out or from across the country moving here. Um, my I rationalized that by saying that the you know the people that live here are people who have never left, and I've got social connections that are deep that go back, you know, to high school or grade school or family connections. And they're not really interested in forming new friendships in their thirties or forties or fifties. Yeah. Right? Who's this new guy? <laughs> yeah. What's, what's the point here? Right. Never mind that I was in a famous band that, that could, that carried no weight here. Um, but the turning point was when I opened my guitar shop on day one, I said, I'm going to start this charity where I'm going to collect guitars and I'm going to give away a hundred guitars to kids who can't afford them. And I had no idea how that would happen. None. 
But I just said, this is part of Bob's guitar service from day one. So every customer that came in the store, I told them that. And after about, I don't know, a month of that, people started showing up. And then the real Kitchener revealed itself to me because people came out of the woodwork and said, what can I do? How can I help? Here's some guitars. Here's a check for $100. Do you take keyboards? You know, this type of thing. And I, that was, I'm getting a little um, goosebumps talking about it, but that was the turning point where I felt at home in Kitchener because Kitchener's true spirit of rallying around a cause or giving um, shone through. Um, and so starting that uh, little charity was the uh, probably the best thing I ever did, uh, certainly for my social life. Thanks for meeting us in Bond Park. Please like, rate, and subscribe to our podcast on the platform that you're listening to. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Bond Park Podcast. Original music by Alan Lung.